I've, uh, my understanding of these things or my guesses about what's going on come from uh, social epidemiology, uh, trying to understand social gradient in health and social determinants of health. And the big change in our understanding, uh, and one where Clyde's work has been really important, is how important the psychosocial mediation is. So it's not simply the bricks and mortar that give you heart disease, it's actually what you feel about being at the bottom um, and uh, uh, the, the effects on uh, in a, uh, basically th working through chronic stress and increasingly people understand the physiological effects of chronic stress on the immune system, the cardiovascular system and often I think increasingly you hear people likening its effects to more rapid aging. It, it's a powerful uh, um, physiological influence. But the main, I think the main groups of psychosocial risk factor for poor health that we've become aware of can be grouped in these, in these categories. Things to do with low social status, uh, things to do with weak social connections, almost any measure of uh, uh, social connectedness, whether it's relationships with our partners or how many friends or involvement in community life, all highly protective. Also experimental data that shows that uh, we have higher resistance to infection and wound healing is faster um, uh, if we have uh, good social relationships. And the other part of this is stress in early life, both maternal stress in pregnancy and uh, um, things like uh, the quality of, of uh, early childhood, um, domestic conflict, um, uh, poor attachment, things like that. Um, which affect health right into my age and older. A long shadow forwards, people often say. But it seemed to me that maybe there was a common element running through these, that there was a sort of, that maybe the insecurities that go with low social status are rather like the insecurities that, uh, that you might have from a difficult early childhood. Uh, we, we talk about insecurity or anxiety or feeling you're not valued. And friendship fits into that pattern because if you have friends, you know, there are people who like you, you feel better, but you get positive feedback from your friends. You feel, oh, I'm all right. You know, they like my company. But if you feel um, people avoid you, you're excluded, um, people, um, you know, don't want your company, we all very quickly have those, that sense of vulnerability, of fearing that we're unattractive, we're boring, we're whatever it is. And actually for, you see, what this is about is really our susceptibility to emotions like shame and embarrassment. Um, a psychologist, Thomas Sheff, calls shame and embarrassment the social motions because they are what um, makes us conform. And, and see, in a, in a creature like human beings that depends on a learned cultural way of life rather than on uh, instinctively programmed behavior, <coughs> How we learn to behave in acceptable ways is by being susceptible to each other's eyes, uh, experiencing ourselves through each other's eyes. And you know when people do something awful in front of other people, they say, I, I just wish the ground would have swallowed me up. Um, and because, you see, you are the bearers of culture. And for me to learn to behave in acceptable ways, I have to be sens sensitive to your judgments. And so part of being a human being is to be sensitive to shame and embarrassment and our worries about being looked down on and, our, and other people's judgments of us. And those are heightened in a modern mass society where we're meeting new people all the time instead of being embedded, as we were only a generation or two ago in fairly stable communities. You know, I remember meeting people who'd never been out of their hometown. Um, in the 1950s. Uh, so, I suspect that uh, what we're dealing with is that sort of difficulty, uh, worries about self-presentation, how we're judged, how we're seen, and need to keep up appearances and so on. Uh, I, did, I developed that kind of explanation when I found a meta-analysis of 208 studies of experiments where people had been invited into a psychological laboratory and given nasty, stressful things to do, 
while having that cortisol, that cortisol is one of the central stress hormones measured, so they were interested in seeing how much cortisol went up when people were doing these nasty tasks. And the meta-analysis reviewing all these studies was really interested in what kind of tasks most reliably push up cortisol levels. And what they found was it was tasks that included social evaluative threat, uh, threats to self-esteem, social status, in which others can judge you negatively. And that's a, a quote from the paper. Uh, those are the sort of things that get to us, which get under the skin, very much confirming the sort of interpretation I was giving you about how all those things come together. It's also why violence is more common in more unequal societies. It's not simply the rich attacking the poor. Uh, uh, sorry, no, the poor attacking the rich. <laughs> I, um, actually, inequality you could regard as the rich attacking the poor. Um, but this is a prison psychiatrist who says, I have yet to see a serious act of violence in the second paragraph um, that was not provoked by the experience of feeling shamed and humiliated, disrespected and ridiculed. And it's because violence is triggered by people feeling humiliated, disrespected. Uh, very much the same ballpark as what I was talking about. Um, but another pattern, I think, is part of this. Uh, this is, uh, again, um, rather old data, but it illustrates it well, and it's nice to have, I and mean, when I'm talking to economists, it's very nice to have a study that comes from people at the World Bank. I sometimes feel that's all that some economists will respect. Uh, this is an experiment, uh, I heard a growl. Um, <laughs> um, this is an experiment in which kids are asked to do mazes, finding their way into the center on pieces of paper, and the question is how many can they do in a given time? The high and low caste children in India, from Indian villages, and when they don't know each other's caste, they do them equally well. But when they do know who are the high caste and who are the low caste kids, suddenly performance in the low caste drops off. And there are just lots of, these are called stereotype threat experiments. They've been done hundreds of times in different contexts. You can do it with men and women. You give them, I don't know, mathematical or spatial things to do, and women do them pretty well as well. And, and except when you say, uh, women are often thought to be less good at this kind of thing than men, and then the women's performance, or with ethnicity in the States. Uh, you give a, a test and you say, this is not a test of cognitive ability. And black students do uh, as well as the white ones. But if you say, this is a test of cognitive ability, um, black performance falls off. So we're highly sensitive to these crude social stereotypes. And indeed, I think it's really important to think about that in relation to how early uh, the signs of school failure uh, kick in. Um, in kids, and I've met people who just felt the whole of their educational experience was being taught how hopeless they were, and are so phobic about school that they won't, as adults, even walk down the street where their school was. You know, that sort of pain. Um, I would like to spend time telling you about how this relates to um, uh, moving towards sustainability, because I think what we've got to do is pick, put together a picture of the future society we need to move to, towards, not only with a greater equality, but also reducing carbon emissions and so on. Uh, and one of the things, of course, is that, that consumerism is the greatest threat to uh, getting anywhere near sustainability. But it's driven uh, a substantial part of the driver for consumerism is status competition. <coughs> And that's amplified, intensified by inequality. And in more unequal societies, as you see here, people work longer hours. They also save less of their income. They spend more. They get into debt more. Um, and that's because matter, money matters even more in those societies. It's how you show what you're worth. Um, but also, more equal societies are more public-spirited because there's more involvement in community life higher levels of trust. People are more aware of the common good. And of course, reducing carbon emissions is going to depend on, on being aware of the common good on a worldwide scale. And this is, uh, shows more equal societies are better at recycling. 
This shows that business leaders in more equal societies think it's more important that their governments should abide by international environmental agreements. Um, because, of course, in more equal societies, everyone knows you have to fend for yourself and damn the others. I think the take-home message is that we must stop thinking about now, about the progress, about improving the quality of life through uh, economic growth, through consumerism stuff. We've got to the end of that. It's a zero-sum game. I mean, of course, we can improve our lot if we move up in our existing society, but if everyone moves up together, there's no net benefit to the society. And the way we should now be improving the real social quality, the real quality of life, is by improving the quality of social relations. And it was very sad, that very good book on happiness, Richard Layard, a uh, book on happiness, he ends up by saying... Uh, the solution is that we should all go and have cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, and actually he's managed to get much more of it provided by the government because of that. But actually what this data is telling us, I think, is if we reduce the scale of inequality, we improve the psychosocial well-being of the whole society.